Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about understanding the work comp settlement process in the state of Missouri. And uh, I'll be explaining some detail in that. It, it, what I also would like to do is first introduce myself. My name is Lynn Peoples. I'm with Missouri Employers Mutual. I'm a field service manager and I've been with the company for about seven years and I have multiple years of claims experience. Uh, actually been fortunate enough to be in Kansas City for quite some time through my whole claims career. What I'd like to do is present this information to you and hopefully go through the process so you can ask questions. We're going to try to take a break at about 15 minutes and 30 minutes into the presentation to ask answer any questions that you have. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to explain my role as a field service manager. Uh, there are three of us that do the field service manager function within MEM. There's, I take care of the western portion of the state as well as Kansas and, and Nebraska. And then there, we've got a central region, Terry Sweeten, who takes care of the central region of Missouri and the eastern portion of Iowa and Arkansas. And then Steve Summers is in the western area, or I'm sorry, the eastern area. And he takes care of eastern Missouri and Illinois and down into the Tennessee area. So that's pretty much there our coverage. We also do claims training for our staff. We do field investigations. We do a, a lot of we're assisting in the marketing and the sales process. So those are basic functions that we perform. Um, but with that, I'm going to also introduce the co-presenter today. Her name is Laura Sides Cooper. She's one of our defense counsel out of our house counsel uh, comp legal. And Laura, I'll turn it over to you to let you introduce yourself. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, as Lynn said, my name is Laura Cooper, and I'm a senior litigation attorney in the Chesterfield office. Um, I've been with MEM for seven years. I spent about four years in the claims department as litigation specialist, um, actually working some of our most serious claims, um, and then moved over to Comp Legal about three years ago as a defense attorney. Um, prior to that, I actually worked at a law firm where MEM was one of my main clients as outside counsel. So I'm happy to be here today. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll start by the with the first slide, and I want to start talking just briefly about this information. First of all, each work comp case is different. The facts are different. The circumstances are different. Um, so basically, I put a disclaimer on here, and if you run into a work comp claim that becomes litigated, please consult a professional legal counsel to provide legal advice to you. This isn't going to be considered legal advice, although we, between Laura and myself, we probably have 40 years of experience. But really, you need to consult with an attorney to provide this kind of ex this kind of advice as we go through. So I just throw that out as a disclaimer going through the process. Um, some of the objectives that we're going to try to accomplish today in the presentation is we're going to talk about communicating and understanding the role of a policyholder with an injured employee once a case becomes litigated. We're going to also try to understand the steps necessary to help manage and control the claims from a policyholder standpoint, what kinds of things you can do to help manage the claim and also help manage the employee and make sure that the employee doesn't feel like they're getting lost in the whole process because sometimes they can. A lot of people, they, you know, they hear the name going to court or hear the name about a lawyer being involved and it sometimes can cause panic and they're not sure what to do. And it would be very helpful for you as the employer to kind of help set them at ease. And then we can talk about some of the communication that has to take place between your insurance carrier, you as the employer and the employee. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail as we move on. Um, we also want to define key terms and terminology involved in, in a settlement. And we're going to talk about that as we go through how we, we really don't just pull a number out of the sky as far as a settlement offer that we're making. There's actually formulas, and those formulas vary by state. But since we're going to be talking specifically about Missouri today, I'm going to break those formulas out, provide some definitions so that hopefully everybody understands what we're trying to say when we come up with a figure. Again, this is going to be Kind of the example I'm going to use is going to be more of a straightforward scheduled injury. Some of the, there's a lot of other things that are involved that we're not going to be able to get into today regarding Medicare set aside agreements or protecting Medicare's interests and cases become litigated and other activities that have to take place between defense counsel and plaintiff counsel. It, it gets a lot deeper than just this presentation, but these are the basics in, in a regular scheduled injury and hopefully it will give you a better idea of how 
how your adjuster or claim rep comes up with a dollar figure when it comes time to try to make an offer and try to get a case settled. So we're going to go into more detail on that as we move forward. But that's those are the objectives we're going to try to accomplish today. And hopefully I don't confuse everybody as I describe how we come up with calculations for the settlement. Laura's going to talk a little bit about in the latter part of the presentation, the importance of rating reports and the physician selections when it comes time for a settlement. We want to make sure that we get the right doctors involved so that we do get more conservative ratings or more accurate occupational ratings from the physicians who handle work comp more frequently than doctors who don't have that experience. We're also, Laura is also going to talk about the explanation and discussion of the legal process relative to court settings, documents, conferences, pre-hearings, regular hearings, appeals to the commission, circuit court and to the Supreme Court. We're not going to get all that far into it up to the Supreme Court level, but she's going to give you some background in what happens relative to conferences and pre-hearings and, and regular hearings. She's also going to talk a little bit and give everybody an update on the impact COVID-19 has had on scheduling and, and basically the overall settlement process in, in the work comp claims. Right now, as many of you have heard since March of last year, it, it sometimes these elective surgeries and surgeries that have to take place really in regards to a work comp case, many of the surgeries are considered elective, like a knee surgery or shoulder surgery, fractured arm. I mean, some of the things are more emergency that have to have surgery, but if it's an elective surgery that can wait, it has delayed the process of getting in to see a treating doctor, and it also has, has delayed the rating, getting rating reports from the doctors. And in addition to that, it's also called cause delays in the court system. Docketing process has changed, and the Lord's going to talk more about that. A lot of things have gone virtual, where in the past their actual personal appearance had to take place. So she's going to give you some more insight in how that's taking place as a result of COVID. So that's that's kind of the summary relative to what we're going to try to accomplish as of our, our objectives. Um, the thing I want to talk about right now really is employer steps that are necessary to help manage litigation claim. The very first thing, and I'm sure if many employers are on the line right now, they probably hear their, their insurance carrier always coaching them or trying to persuade them to make sure that they're properly and timely reporting the claim. And that is critical so that the insurance company can make the proper contacts to do the investigation. But it's not only important to the insurance company to make a compensability decision and complete our investigation, we've got to consider the impact it has on the injured employee. If the claim is not reported for a week or 10 days or whatever the case may be, and it's delayed, that means the insurance company has no idea that the claim is even out there. The employee is wandering around, maybe asking you questions, maybe not, but has no direction, no guidance, no coaching, no information, no education. So they're sitting out there wondering. And once you create an environment like that, and they're sitting there watching TV and they're seeing a plaintiff attorney or a claimant attorney commercial, you know where they're going to go. They're going to go for help and they're going to go outside the work comp realm, which would be you as the employer, us as the insurance carrier, and the individual employee. So it's critically important to report the claim so that we can jump on it, do the investigation, and also explain the benefits so that we can provide an outlook of what may happen or what will happen, how the how the process works. We can explain the waiting period. We can explain how much we pay in, in wage replacement. We can walk them through that whole process and give them a phone number and a name so that it, when a question comes up, they have a contact that they can get some information and they're not left out there floating in the in the breeze without any direction or any guidance. The next bullet point I put on here is really the maintaining communication and contact with your employee. Uh, they're still your employee, whether they get hurt or not. They, you, you continue to remain their employer, and they look for you for direction. I mean, I don't know. It depends on how long they've worked for you and, and what your relationship is with that employee. But it's critically important that you're candid with the employees, you communicate with the employees, and they feel that you have empathy for them and that you're trying to help them through the process. Keep in mind, some of these cases come in that may be questionable. They may not be compensable in your mind. Well, it's got to be reported quickly so that we can make contact with those involved, whether it be the injured employee, perhaps witnesses, if we have to follow up on medical reports. All of that information is critical for us to make a compensability decision. And if, if that's the case, we'll tell the employee we have to accomplish this set of, this set of activities 
before we make a, a, a firm decision of whether or not we're going to be paying the benefits. But we have to be candid with them. We have to explain what to expect and, and make them feel like they have support from their employer, that they're getting information from their insurance carrier, and they don't feel like they're they're floating in the breeze out there and they, they, they just don't have any guidance or help. Um, I will tell you, and a lot of employers and people don't realize this, but once an employee hires an attorney and that attorney files a lawsuit or a Form 21 or a petition, it's really the first step in a work comp litigation claim. Once an employee becomes litigated, the insurance company can no longer have contact with that employee. We have to then start communicating with the employee's attorney. And sometimes you, you, you don't have a rapport. I mean, all the things I just described, you try to establish a rapport with the injured worker. And in this case, we want to make sure that we try to keep an attorney out of it and provide the information that they need. But the truth of the matter is, once they become litigated, that kind of takes us out of the ability to form that rapport and to communicate directly with the employee. And something is lost in that process. So again, if the employee feels like you've reported the claim, and they hear from their insurance company, they feel like there's some empathy involved and that you care about their treatment and their, their, their basic life, that helps manage some of the litigation. A bullet point I've got on here is that in Missouri law, um, attorneys are able to receive a 25% fee of any settlement. It, you know, it's 25% of the settlement plus any fees for, you know, independent medical exams and other fees that are associated with it. But the plaintiff attorney can walk away with 25%. If it's a $10,000 settlement, the claimant attorney can walk away putting $2,500 in their pocket. The employee's left with $7,500. So it's really important to try to help manage that. The other part of that is if we can keep an attorney out of the whole picture and we can make get, get an independent rating from the defense doctor, we can get an offer on the table quickly and make an offer before attorney comes into the picture. And if we can get that offer out there before an, an attorney gets involved, the, the plaintiff attorney or the claimant attorney is only entitled to 25% of those additional fees after an offer has been made. So if you had a $10,000 settlement that you made to the employee and the employee upset, upset accepts that, then we've got a $10,000 settlement, but the employee gets an attorney and they, they can come in and take 25% of that. And let's say, for example, we've offered $5,000 to the employee. The claimant attorney, if we end up settling that case for $10,000, the claimant attorney is only going to get 25% of that additional $5,000 that, that I was talking about. So it's really important to try to help manage that litigation so that we can keep the attorneys out and try to avoid putting putting the employee through a ringer and not, not really understanding what's going on. And we really need to make sure that they understand the court process and the hearings and that type of thing. Again, just make sure that you try to maintain that communication with your employee. They, they continue to be your employee. You're not prohibited from talking to them. Matter of fact, it makes a big difference if the, if the employee feels like the employer cares about their treatment and what's going on. Um, other things that we ask employers to do is to help us gather information. A lot of times in today's world, everybody has a cell, cell, uh, cell phone. Take pictures if you can, or have supervisors be trained to make sure they take pictures. It makes a big difference from the facts of the accident so that we can put the pieces together. Something I didn't put on the slide, but it also has an impact on our subrogation so that if you have a design defect or some kind of a problem with some equipment that you have, if there's something that's faulty, and someone else's fault that caused the accident, you as the employer and us as the insurance company are entitled to recover money from that negligence party. So if you can preserve evidence through a picture, it makes a big picture speak much louder than words. And if you can gather pictures at the time of the accident, it makes a huge difference. So I encourage you to do that. And the point of the whole thing is just try to make sure that you're giving, that you're providing the investigative material to your insurance carrier so that they can take it from there and delve more into the facts of the accident. Another item that you probably see all the time and it probably drives you crazy is that you get requests for wage statements. And I know it's time consuming. It takes a lot of time to go back and figure out, you know, what everybody's wages were. Um, it, basically, the law requires that you go back thir in Missouri it, to go back 13 weeks prior to the accident and we come up with an average weekly wage. You'll see in a little bit when in the presentation, how come that's so important? Because that's a key, that's a key part of how to calculate and come up with a dollar figure to settle a PPD or a permanent partial disability claim. So it's not just something we're doing to bug you. It's not something that we're doing to create hardship. It's something that we have to have in order to come up with 
an accurate wage weekly wage which then equates into a temporary total disability or wage replacement and permanent partial disability so it's it's really important to have that information a lot of times cases become litigated because there's an argument over what the wages wages are so we really need to have accurate information again to keep an attorney from taking a case that maybe we get into a dispute with the employee we just need to make sure we've got the information and are capable capable of explaining that to the injured worker the last thing that we've got on this particular slide and I know Laura had brought this up in prior conversations and prepping for this call. Um, <clears throat> if you get any kind of legal correspondence, there are time constraints. It's critical. And, I, and I'll show you some examples of forms, but it's absolutely critical that you get that information to the insurance company as quickly as you can. From a lawsuit standpoint or a Form 21 standpoint, once the state has received that, there's all, the, the defense attorneys only have 30 days to make an, a formal legal answer to that those allegations made on that form 21 and they can't just do it off the cuff they have to do some research to make sure that their answers are accurate relative to the allegations being made so and it's not just that I mean you, you'll get pre-hearing conferences you get hearing conferences you may get a, a letter of representation or some letter from a a claimant or a plaintiff attorney that's asking for information it's critical that you get that information to your defense counsel or to the insurance company so that we can timely answer those kinds of requests so with that being said I'll move on to the next slide but again that correspondence is critical you need to be able to identify what mail is time sensitive um, the other topic that I'm going to talk about is terminology after this slide I'm going to stop and answer any questions or take some questions but uh, I want to cover this so that when we do get into the next portion of the presentation uh, that, that you understand the terminology used. It's, it's kind of hard to do a presentation like this when we have so many participants and not positive what your experience level is. I could be talking to a risk manager that's been doing this for 15 years or I could be talking to somebody that just took over the work comp responsibilities two months ago. And I just want to make sure that I'm not talking under or talking over people, but these things are critical as we handle particular claims. And a lot of people, I know it burns me up when I sit there and talk to somebody in some other business and they start throwing acronyms at me and I don't understand what they mean. I mean, it's like they're talking Greek to me. And these are some of the acronyms that are used in the work comp process. And it's really critical to understand what they are. The first one that comes to mind is MMI, which means maximum medical improvement. Okay, well, what does that really mean? It really is a term or terminology used by the treating doctor who says, okay, I've treated this employee. I think I've got them back as well as they can be. I have no further treatment to offer. They have reached the maximum medical improvement for any treatment or procedures that I can perform to make this employee better. He's basically improved. So once we get an MMI report, what the claim rep does or, or the claims adjuster, they immediately send a letter to the treating doctor and say, okay, thanks for all your medical reports. Thanks for giving us MMI. Does this employee have any residual permanent partial disability as a result of the accident on such and such a date? At that point in time, the doctor will send something back saying zero, or they'll send something back saying it's a 10% disability. And I'll show you what that 10% means. It's 10% it's of a certain body part or 10% of a body. Uh, it's 10% of something. And then I'll show you how we come up with a calculation for settlement here in just a little bit. But that's how the process starts out. The doctor has provided all the treatment they can, whether it be surgery, whether, whether it be physical therapy, anything that they are offering the employee, when they feel that they've done all they can do for the employee, that's what we classify or define as maximum medical improvement. Average weekly wage, um, that's basically what I was talking about when I mentioned the 13-week wage statement. It's very important to have that information available so that we can prove to the claimant attorney we can provide that wage statement to them to show how we came up with those calculations and hopefully come to an agreement on the average weekly wage. Temporary total disability, which we're not going to get into a lot today because really temporary total disability is basically wage replacement for the employee provided the doctor has authorized them off. It, it equates to 66.6667% of their average weekly wage up until a max, a maximum rate. And I'll show you a chart here in, in a little bit what that max rate is for each injury date. But that's basically what temporary total disability is. PPD is permanent partial disability, which again is based upon the average weekly wage. And that too is going to be included in the chart that I'm going to cover with you. 
One of the other items that we talk about is IME, which is an independent medical exam. It's an alternate medical opinion that really has an impact on what what's going on. I mean, if, if we get a rating, the claimant attorney gets a rating, we decide that we're, we're going to go out for an alternate opinion and get an agreement with the employee and, and the employee's attorney. It may be that we get an independent medical exam. It may be an independent medical exam as far as whether certain type of treatment is necessary. But again, it's an independent exam of the employee to provide additional medical facts so that we can handle the claim. The last item that we've got here is prevailing factor, and I'm going to turn that, this, this is important enough, I'm going to show you a slide all its own on prevailing factor. And, and Laura and I were teasing, we were talking yesterday about this or this morning, about this prevailing factor is a definition that's in the statute, and it, we call it new law, <laughs> but new law was actually developed in 2005, so basically this new law is 16 years old. Prior to that, the law said that any injury that's a subsequent cause of the accident could be compensable. In 2005, the statute changed to read as this. The law states that the injury must be the prevailing factor. What does prevailing factor mean? It says in relation to all other factors, this, this injury, this accident and this injury are both a resulting medical condition and disability of the accident that happened at work. So primary fact and factor really means it's a driving factor or the key cause of what's caused medical condition and disability. Just being at work does not make an injury work-related. We have to rely on doctors a lot to make a determination. The adjuster can't make an, a, a compensability decision or a causation opinion themselves. We have to rely on the medical providers to give us that information, and that's what we talk about when we ask for prevailing factor from the treating doctor. Um, there's new case law that is allowing us, perhaps in certain cases, where there's some deviation or some situation that puts the employee in an environment where it doesn't take them really outside of their, their job responsibilities. It could happen to anybody in their normal common life, and we have, actually have to make this compensability decisions based upon that new law that's guiding factor and when when something is in the course and scope of employment or when it is it could happen to anybody in their normal life. Um, it's critically important that we investigate the claims and try to gather all the facts that we can. Um, at this point in time, I think it's 1225. Why don't we go ahead? Terry Sweeten is taking some questions. Terry, do we have any questions that I can clarify before I move on? You do, and this might be a question for both of you, but should bonuses be included in the 13-week wage statement? Laura, you want to take that one? Sure. So I can take that one. Um, they can be. There's a provision provision in the statute, and actually um, I'll have to grab that, that says that um, if they're up to a certain amount, and I'll, I'll clarify that in just a second, I think it's up to uh, 3%, but I need to check on that. Um, then they would be included. If they're below that, then they would not be included. So um, sometimes they can be, sometimes they're not in Missouri, but there is a specific statute addressing that. Thank you. Would you then want them to forward the bonus under a separate statement, or how would you want that information forwarded to uh, the claims rep or the attorney for the, um, as far as the wages to be presented to us? Yeah, so that's a great question. So typically, um, it, it, that that only counts for the wage statement calculation if it's paid during the time period, during that 13-week snapshot that we're taking. Um, so if it is, then allocate that as, or note that on the wage statement that that was a one-time bonus. Um, sometimes employers will put that on a separate line or they'll have, you know, two um, line number twos where they indicate that it's a separate payment just for the bonus. But just note that on the wage statement so that we know. Um, you will also have to provide, um, it states that it is of the total compensation that they've received for the year. Um, and so we also will have to know that in order to figure the percentage um, to figure out exactly how much it is. Um, and so you'll have to give us what that total number is so that we can determine if it's below the 3% or above the 3%. And again, I'll have to check that statute, but I think it's 3%. For now, that's all the questions we have. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on then. The wage statement, I just thought I would, this is just a 
copy and paste of a wage statement. A different insurance companies' wage statements look a little bit different, but this is the actual wage statement. It, it, the lines go down all the way to 13 or even goes further than that to provide the information, but this is the type of information that we've got. You need to include the date, date of incident if you've got it, the claim number, your name as the employer and the injured employee's name, and then put the dates and the earnings down that line and, and email that fax scan it however you want to get it back to your employer the quicker we get that the quicker we can come up with a compensation rate and get the benefits started to the employee so there's no no delay in the employee having at least some income while they're off work um, moving on to the next question it's our next set of definitions or terminology what is a defense rating report well i talked a little bit before about the treating doctor providing information relative to mmi but the defense rating is normally done by the treating doctor and we ask them, as I mentioned earlier, we ask them to provide a PPD rating or asking if there is any PPD. So basically that is representing the PPD associated with the employer's side of the equation. Once we get a rating, we can do calculations. Sometimes that changes if they hire an attorney or if they make a counteroffer after being non, not being represented. And I'll show you as we go along how that comes about. But once we have a defense rating or insurance companies have a defense rating, they do have the initial stage or a, a initial tool to make an offer to the employee to try to begin the settlement process. Um, what's an opposing counsel or the injured employee's rating report? It's really what it says. If the employee hires an attorney, the attorney's probably gonna send him to a more liberal doctor that may provide or may supply a, 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 a a more liberal rating they may increase the permanent partial disability to a higher percentage and at that point in time let's say for example and i mentioned this earlier if we if we as the insurance carrier or the employer let's say for example if we get a 10 percent rating back to the shoulder then we we can do a calculation and i'm going to show you how to do that on a shoulder here in just a little bit but what happens is the employee and employee attorney they seek an opinion of their own and they'll say that doctor comes back and says well i think they've got permanent disability of 20%. So now you see what happens. We've got a low end at 10% and a high end at 20%. And ho hopefully, and this is more of a run of the mill kind of a case, but you set parameters of where you can start negotiating and trying to resolve that case someplace between the 10 and 20%, depending on the factual, factual circumstances and your ability to negotiate away some of those strong points that the plaintiff attorney may have, or maybe emphasize the strong points you have on your case. So. That's where the process starts is once each each side, whether it be the employee and the employee's attorney or the employer and the insurer, get their own ratings. That's when the process begins of trying to come up and evaluate the settlement process. This next slide I've already mentioned before, uh, the plaintiff ratings, and it's really not just the plaintiff ratings, it's affecting the conservative side or the employers and the insurer's side. It's taking longer to get in to see some of these doctors because of COVID and if that, that, that just delaying the whole process and it's lengthening the settlement process time. So just, just so you're aware of that, a lot of times it looks like maybe nobody's doing anything, but maybe they're not doing anything because doctor's offices are packed or they're not taking certain patients. So that's really important. And again, that delays the whole settlement process. I mentioned earlier that I was gonna talk about the, um, the litigation process. A Form 21 in the state of Missouri is basically a formal claim for compensation. It's the first step of a litigated case. It's like a petition. So if you see one, and I'm gonna show you a copy of one here in a minute, but it has to be handled with kit gloves and has to be sent to your employer or insurer as quickly as possible. It's an official legal document that formally begins the legal process in litigating a work comp case. As I mentioned earlier, you, the, the employer insurer and their defense counsel only have 30 days from the date it's filed with the state to provide an answer. The answer to that is, and it doesn't only have to be filed by an employee. An employee can, can fill out one of these forms themselves and file it pro se, or meaning they can file it on their own behalf. So it doesn't have to be an attorney that files a Form 21. Again, we still have to have a response and, and follow up within 30 days of when the state receives that response. The next part of this is, is I say Form 21 continued. When I say that the employer has, and the defense counsel and the insurer have 30 days to answer, the answer is done through a tool called a Form 22. And it's basically a legal document that answers all allegations in the Form 21, so that if they're saying that they're permanently and totally disabled, we can 
we as the insurer and the defense counsel and the employer can say, well, we don't believe that there's permanent total exposure for for these reasons and basically answer in, in the negative saying we don't believe this is permanent total case. Again, there's that 30 day time frame that I talked about. Because of, because of space constraints and my inability to do PowerPoints, this is a claim for compensation, what they look like. It's a Form 21. If you look at the top of it, you can see the information that they've got. But if you see that word claim for compensation, it's really important that you make sure that you handle this thing and get it and get it to your employer and your defense counsel so that an answer can be filed timely. This is a copy of what a Form 22 looks like, which is the answer to that petition. And it, again, in bold print there, it says answer to claim for compensation. Again, that has to be filed within a time frame so that that we respond. If you don't respond to them timely, there's a very good chance that the employer is admitting to all the allegations that that employee made or employee's attorney has made in that Form 21. That's why I keep harping on the fact that it's critically important that this gets to your insurance carrier and defense counsel because if you miss the time date, it's not just like, oh, too bad. It's like you may admit to all the allegations on that Form 21. And I don't mean to try to scare anybody, but that happens. I see it not frequently, but it does happen. Um, I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. It looks like I'm running a little bit behind on schedule here, but I want to talk about how we come up with calculating a permanent total disability or a permanent partial disability. As I mentioned earlier, we have to have that wage statement, 13-week wage statement that gives us information so that we can calculate how much we owe on a weekly basis for the calculations of the settlement. We have to have the rating report from the rating doctor indicating the percent of permanent partial disability. And as I said, it, it can be compounded if the employee hires an attorney and gets their rating report. So we'll have two separate and different rating reports that we have to address. And then lastly, when they give that PPD rating, we also have to, they have to apply, the doctors have to apply that to say 10% of the arm or 10% of the hip or 10% of the body as a whole. It just depends how the doctor words that rating report as to how we have to apply the calculations. And I'm gonna show that here in just, just one second. Um, as I mentioned, TTD is the weekly wage replacement and it's calculated at 0.6667 of the in, injured workers employee, is injured workers average weekly wage. The example I gave here to do easy calculations is $1,000 a week. If you multiply that times 0.6667, that calculation comes up to $666.70. Um, but you've got to then check on this rate table, which I'm going to show you in a minute to make sure that they that doesn't put them over the max maximum amount for the rate. The same thing is applicable on the PPD rate, although the PPD rate, permanent partial disability schedule, the rates are, are smaller than they are on the weekly wage replacement. And I'll show you that here in just one second. Um, there's two types of settlements. There's a settlement to scheduled injuries, which could be a hand, a wrist, an elbow, a hip, a knee, an ankle. It could be any body part that's not part of the trunk. When I say the trunk, I'm talking the chest, the neck, the head, the low back. Anything directly to the trunk of the body has to be considered, or uh, or multiple body parts has to be considered an injury to the body as a whole, which you can see in a minute. That's worth 400 weeks, whereas in this example, the shoulder injury is worth 232 weeks. And I know you're probably asking yourself, well, what does 220, 232 weeks or 400 weeks mean? Well, here's what it means. I'm going to show you these charts. Here is a, this is a, a chart published by the Division of Work Comp in the state of Missouri. And I know it's kind of small and you probably can't see the whole thing, but again, we call this the body chart and it's used to do the calculations. The body as a whole is worth 400 weeks. But if you look in real small print, there's, you see up the shoulder right there, it's got numbers down that arm right there. And that number is for a scheduled injury. And the example I'm gonna use here in just a minute is gonna be 232 weeks, which represents the shoulder. But each one of these body parts are different. So if the injury is at the hip, which is right here, that's 207 weeks versus the shoulder at 232 weeks. And then they even go down to the foot and the fingers. So that body chart is really important to have so you know where we're grabbing these numbers from. This is that wage, co that compensation rate that I was talking about. The first chart, first level here is temporary total, temporary total 
wage replacement, which we're not going to really get into detail, but that provides you information on the max amount of weekly benefits that we can pay. But then permanent partial disability are, are lesser amounts, but we take this figure for what their average weekly wage is and we plug it into the formula that I'm going to show you here in just a second. Um, here's an example. We're going to use this shoulder injury, the accident date of 7-4-2021. Let's use an average weekly wage of $1,000. Again, as I showed you, you look up the body chart, and the shoulders were 232 weeks based on the body chart I previously showed you. The average weekly wage you also need, which is $1,000 a week, but it can, the, the comp rate comes out to 666.70. However, the rate chart, the maximum on the rate chart is $566.88. So rather than using 666.70, you use the lesser amount, which is the max of 566. Let's assume the doctor rates PPD at the shoulder for an accident date of 74. We take that 10% and we do see the bottom line right here. The calculations are performed this way. You take 232 weeks, which represents the shoulder, times 10% of the permanent partial disability rating provided by the doctor. That equates out to 23.2 weeks. You take that 22.3 weeks times the PPD comp rate, which is the 566, which is derived from the wage statement, that gives you a settlement amount of $13,151. Now, let me rephrase what I said before. This is a starting point. A lot of other issues come into play when you're negotiating a settlement or when you have a real accident. A lot of claims, I would say probably 60, 70 percent of cases settle just the way I just described them. But there are another 30 or 40 percent of cases that become very litigated and have a lot of other issues come on that I, there's no way that could be addressed in a presentation like this. But just kind of the heart of the matter is that's how that figure is, is calculated. It's not a figure that we pull out of the air. It's a figure that's based upon a work comp formula, and which is being driven by the statute of the state of Missouri. So with that being said, I think that's the last slide I have. Um, I'm going to move it on to this next slide. But Terry, are there any other questions before I turn this over to Laura? One question. Uh, can an employer attend a docket or a conference? Sure they can. Laura, you can take that one too, since you get to meet with the employers when they attend with you. Sure. So I'm going to address this a little bit in the presentation. Um, before, prior to COVID, that was something that was much easier to do. Um, absolutely, you're allowed to attend um, as long as there are no restrictions for attendance due to COVID. So um, I used to have a lot of the employers that would attend dockets with me when the divisions were fully open. Um, and so if you are wanting to do that, just let your claim rep know, let your defense attorney know. Um, the judges are, are happy to accommodate that. Um, with regard to COVID, a lot of our settings are being done virtually. So um, we can still accommodate that with WebEx or with conference calls. We just have to know in advance. Um, so you'll want to contact us and make sure that we have the correct contact information. And so we can let the judge know that there's going to be another party on the line. Um, and I did just really quickly want to clarify. Um, so I did find the statute um, that discusses bonuses, and it is 287.253, um, and says that a monetary bonus paid by an employer to an employee of up to 3% of the yearly compensation um, will not be included. So um, essentially what we'll need to do is find out how much the bonus was, find out what their yearly compensation is, determine if it's over 3% or under 3%. If it's over, we'll include it. If it's under, we won't. So just a little clarification there. Um, so I think we've got the slide pulled up. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about um, is the importance of physician selection and the impact on the settlement process in Missouri. So I've cited the statute that's section 287.140 that says the employer shall provide such medical care to cure and relieve from the effects of the injury. Now, as you can see, I've underlined the, the word employer because that's important. Um, in Missouri, it's actually the employer that determines um, what physician the injured worker sees. They're the ones who authorize the treatment and determine the, the course of the treatment by determining the authorized treating physician. It's actually the employer, not the insurance company. So um, that gives the employer a lot of um, decision making to make. Um, and so one of the things that, that we wanted to stress is just that, especially in Missouri where the employer does have the right to control treatment, 
Workers' compensation is a unique area of medical practice, and sometimes it does require special expertise for optimal results. Um, Missouri Employers Mutual has been in business a long time. They have a lot of claims representatives and nurse case managers and attorneys who have handled these things for a very long time and know the physicians in Missouri that are very versed in work comp, that are very versed in certain areas of medical practice um, that work well with what we're trying to achieve. Work comp is a difficult area of medicine for some physicians because um, it requires certain things that physicians maybe aren't used to having to provide. Um, sometimes one of the most important things um, is providing timely work status. Um, that's one of the main things that we need from physicians because we need to know what restrictions the injured worker is under. Can the employer accommodate those restrictions? And if not, we're going to owe what's called temporary total disability, which is something that Lynn discussed earlier. So the longer it takes to get those work status and to get those restrictions from the treating physician, the more difficult it is for us and actually can cost us money in the long run. So having physicians that understand the importance of that um, is important and also the timeliness of reports. So not just the work status, but also the actual medical report. Um, what is the status of the treatment? How much longer are they gonna be treating? Are they going to physical therapy? What's the projected MMI date? All of those things, um, effective communication from the doctor with regard to the status of the treatment is extremely important for us in handling the claim. The other part of that is um, sometimes we need doctors to specifically understand the law with regard to work comp because we're asking them for their opinions on causation, uh, medical causation, and whether or not something is the prevailing factor. Um, you see this a lot in cases such as carpal tunnel syndrome. Did the work cause the injury? Was the work the prevailing factor in causing the injury? Um, and there's specific ways that, that those opinions need to be addressed legally in order to assist us in defending the claim. Um, some doctors do it well and other doctors not as much. Um, and mainly that's just because of experience. They're experienced in work comp claims and, and they know how to handle the claims effectively. Um, in more serious claims sometimes also, we may have a doctor that will provide a medical opinion um, and it may be a contested case where we will have to take the doctor's deposition. We'll have to use that deposition later in a trial. And so, especially with those physicians, we want to make sure that they're very familiar with the process, with the law, with, you know, how things work so that we can get the most effective testimony from them as possible. So, uh, we'll want to make sure that we choose a doctor that is, you know, also is very versed in whatever area of the law we're talking about. Um, sometimes you'll see reports from the claimant's attorneys um, that are from, let's say, occupational doctors, but we have a report from you know, a surgeon who actually operates on this type of injury. So, you know, MEM has the, the experience and the expertise to know which doctors are, work well with uh, which, which cases and, and how to choose the doctors that, that best fit with what we're needing to accomplish. The other thing is, um, if we do authorize a doctor, and let's say we don't like the course of treatment or they're not providing timely reports or it's just not working out the way that we hoped, it's very difficult to switch doctors mid-treatment. Um, so we wanna make sure that once we've chosen the authorized treating physician, that it's somebody that we wanna stick with because it makes it very difficult to go in front of a judge later and say, well, yes, we were the ones that chose this doctor, um, but now we decided that we don't like the course of the treatment and so we want a new doctor. They don't look kindly upon that. We really only get kind of one shot in making that determination. So we wanna make sure that we are making the best choice for the case that we have at the beginning of the claim. Um, the last bullet point on this slide is exclusive care agreements. Um, and basically that's just an agreement between MEM and the employer that says that MEM is going to go ahead and choose the physicians for the claim. Sometimes you might be asked to sign one of those. The claim rep might send that to you and just say, you know, look, this is more of a complicated claim. We have some, you know, ideas of where we want this to go with regard to medical treatment so that you don't have to worry about it, you can let us make those decisions. So you, you might see that come your way at some point. All right, I think we can go to the next slide. 
So this is just a, a very brief kind of overview of the workers' compensation uh, legal process and the division in Missouri. Um, workers' compensation cases in Missouri are adjudicated under the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Um, workers' compensation cases are administrative law. They're not adjudicated in the circuit court, um, which some people are a little bit confused about. The ALJs, the administrative law judges, um, are appointed by the governor. It's actually the, the division is part of the executive branch. They're appointed by the governor. Um, and it's meant to be a more informal process than circuit court. Um, the rules of evidence do apply, um, but for the most part, it's an informal process, unlike the more formal processes in circuit court. So I always tell injured workers when I'm talking to them, some of them get nervous about, you know, having to go to court. Do I dress up? Do I, you know, what's the procedure and the protocol? And it's really very informal. The judges have simple courtrooms. They do typically have a bench, but a lot of judges will come down and just sit at the table with us while we discuss the case. Um, much less formal than the procedures in circuit court. There's eight regional offices in the state and they're listed there. And I will say, you know, one of the difficult parts sometimes of practicing um, in the state of Missouri is that um, although the division is housed under one division, um, with these eight separate regional offices, they all have their own local rules for how they handle the process, the procedures. And so it can get a little bit difficult knowing um, you know, the judge, the particular judge that you're in front of, the division that you're under. Um, and so we do have to keep up with, you know, what each division is requiring because sometimes the requirements for each are quite different. Um, let's see, I, I think we can move to the next slide. I did want to talk a little bit about, we, we touched on this just briefly um, about the division being open. Um, technically, the division is open for business. That's what they will say, um, meaning they do have staff there and staff is going in every day. Sometimes the judges are going in, sometimes they're working from home. They do all have the capability of working from home now. So um, it just kind of depends on whether or not they are coming in that day or not coming in that day. Um, it used to be that the attorneys, the defense attorneys and claimants attorneys, we could go down to any of the division offices every day um, and, you know, for our settings or even to have a conversation with the judge. And, and that is really not something that we can do anymore because of COVID. So the way that some of these things have, have changed are um, there, well, I guess let me go through the conference that are the settings and then we'll kind of talk about how they've changed. Um, the first setting is a conference setting, which is essentially the setting that is um, appropriate when there's no formal Form 21 filed. So essentially this would be a setting for a pro se injured worker, someone who's not represented. You will see a notice that will come through that will say a conference setting. Most of those notices now, in fact, I think all of them now are for phone conferences. So it used to be with the conference settings, the parties would go down to the division. Um, I, as the defense attorney, would have a chance to sit down with the injured worker and the employer if the employer's there, discuss the case, make sure all the benefits were paid appropriately, discuss the settlement, and then we would personally go in front of the judge and the judge would make sure that everything looked good and if he or she felt that it did, then they would sign off on the, on the stipulation. Now that's just done with a conference call. What we do is we try and get all of the information to the injured worker prior to the phone call and then we get that signed information to the judge at the time of the call. That way the judge has all the information he or she needs um, and they can approve the stipulation at the time of the setting. Um, typically, the time frame on these settings is about 90 days. Um, sometimes it could be around 60. In some of the divisions, I know in St. Louis, we're usually looking at about 90 days from when we request the setting to when the actual setting occurs. Um, the second setting that's listed is the pre-hearing conference. Um, this is the first step of settings if a formal Form 21 is filed. Um, it's essentially a chance for the parties to get together to talk about the case, uh, to discuss, you know, what they're doing. Are they conducting discovery, gathering medical records? Is somebody still treating? Um, it's, it's typically used just as a way for the parties to communicate. 
prior to COVID, these were also done in person. They were set every 90 days. Um, the parties would go down to the division, they would discuss the claim, and they would provide an update to the judge. The division has changed the policy now so that um, all of these are done by email status update. So there are still notices that are generated and you may see one of those that comes through, um, but it typically will say um, in lieu of appearance status update, email status update to judge. Um, so basically we just have to provide an update to the judge of where the parties are, where we're going, that kind of thing. Um, in St. Louis, uh, the pre-hearing conference is required before a mediation can be set. So we've talked a little bit about some of the delays that have been occurring. This is one of those things that has recently started um, because of the virtual issues and has started delaying our ability to set mediations a little bit. Um, when we get the claim as a defense counsel, we're trying to request a pre-hearing conference immediately to get it on the docket. Those usually take about 60 to 90 days. After the pre-hearing, we're able to request a mediation, which also takes about 60 to 90 days to set. So the result of that is that, let's say we have been in settlement negotiations, but we really need a judge to weigh in on the settlement. Um, and so we wanna get an opinion from a judge. In St. Louis, the minimum time that it takes to get that on the docket is about four months for the mediation, because we have to go through that pre-hearing conference setting first. So um, if you're wondering sometimes why things aren't moving as quickly, that is one of the reasons because we're having some trouble getting mediations set as quickly as we used to. All right, I think we can move to the next slide. Laura, I do have a yeah. quick question and sure. it's, a, it's a really good question. Yeah. Let me see if I can get up here. How can employers gain more control over the decision making process regarding fight or settle questionable claims. Uh, clearly this affects the EMs, that's the cost, which means uh, they're EMOD. Yeah, and you, you cut out just a little bit, I'm sorry, at, at the part where you said fight, I, I missed a little okay. bit of that. Sorry, it says, how can employers gain more control over the decision-making process regarding fight or settle questionable claims? Uh, clearly this affects their EMOD, there's their cost. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. It's a question that, you know, we kind of struggle with all the time. Um, obviously, the more communication that you have, the better. And I would say any, if you're taking anything away from the conversation that we're having today, it's that the more communication, the better. Communication is key. I love it as defense attorney when an employer will call me and really fill me in from their perspective on what's going on. I like to have that perspective, that communication. Maybe there's things that, you know, have come to them that the adjuster maybe doesn't know, or, you know, even just explaining some of the process that will help me in defending the claim. Um, just being involved. There's a lot of employers that, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of employers that aren't, that take a hands-off approach. Um, and I do think the more that the employer is involved and is communicating, uh, the better the results will be with regard to, to fighting some of these. I will say, I get a lot of employers that are frustrated with the time constraints, and I understand that. Um, I've had employers that say, well, you know, this is a fully denied claim. There's no evidence that this is a valid claim. You know, why, why is this remaining open? Um, the unfortunate part of that is that if someone files a Form 21, we have no choice but to defend the claim. We don't control the time frame. We can do what we can do on our side. There are some strategies and things that we can do, um, requesting dismissal, that kind of thing. Um, but the judges, in all honesty, don't love to do that. So, um, you know, we do have our hands tied a little bit, um, but the more communication, the better. Um, and we, we will try as hard as we can to get these things um, adjudicated and, and dismissed, but sometimes there is a bit of a time constraint. One more question, and oh, I, sure. I, I'll keep you, keep you moving here, but um, does MEM have to have an attorney to settle a case? And if so, does an employee have to have an attorney to settle a case? Good question. So the employer and insured does have to have an attorney to settle a case. Um, it's required under the law. So that's also something that may be a good thing to explain to injured workers um, as the case is, is proceeding because sometimes an injured worker will get a letter from me after I've entered the case on behalf of MEM and the employer 
And they freak out a little bit and think, well, why is there an attorney involved in this? I didn't get an attorney. Do I need an attorney? Um, and so I'll get a phone call and I usually try and explain, you know, under the law, MEM is required to have one. They are not required to have one. Um, injured workers can always proceed on their own pro se, um, but they are allowed to have one. It's always their right if they want to hire an attorney. I think Lynn mentioned this earlier, but I do think that one of the big keys to controlling litigation costs is that communication between the claim rep and the defense attorney and the injured worker. If they feel like you're listening to them, you're hearing their concerns, you're taking care of them the way that we should be, um, they're much less likely to go out and hire an attorney. So that's what we try to do um, and be proactive on that basis so that they do not have to hire an attorney. So just a quick rundown, and I'm not going to talk about this much because this is kind of high level, um, but I did want to mention the way that the legal process works. Um, if your case has gone to mediation and most, uh, most of the divisions require the case to be mediated before it can be set for hearing, um, once you pass that mediation, the case can be set for final hearing or for a temporary hearing, a hardship hearing. Um, those are typically reserved for issues of medical treatment or temporary total disability. Um, and then final hearings, final awards are issued at the end of the case. Um, I don't have any recent data, but I know as of a few years ago, I think it was about four to six percent of all litigated cases actually went to hearing. So it's not very common. It's not something that happens often. Um, I, I believe we've also seen that it happens even less frequently um, during COVID just because we, we haven't had as many and they were delayed for a while. Um, but typically cases don't make it to, to trial. I will say um, I just did a Zoom trial a couple weeks ago. So the division is equipped to do that. It actually worked out pretty well. So, um, you know, that is something that they're offering. Um, if the case then is um, adjudicated by final award, there is the um, ability to appeal that to the Labor and Industrial Relations Commission. Um, again, if if there's a reason, then the award can also be appealed from there to the courts of appeal and finally to the Missouri Supreme Court, which again is exceedingly rare, hardly happens, um, sometimes happens when there are circuit courts or courts of appeal that have differing opinions. And so we have to get an overall opinion from the Missouri Supreme Court to kind of settle that, that issue once and for all. Um, we have to consider the expenses of the defense and the interest that would accrue if we were going to appeal any of these awards and also the potential for making bad law. Sometimes we have a question of law um, that we need an answer to, but the honest truth is if we're concerned that we may lose on that appeal, we may determine that it's not worth making bad law in the event that we were to lose. And so we figure out a way to settle that claim. All right, I think we can move on and I'm gonna try to speed up here since we, we don't have much time left. Um, we've touched on most of this, um, just, <clears throat> just so you all know, there are some delays um, due to COVID-19. There's delays in scheduling ratings, IMEs, depositions. Um, we have adapted very well. We're doing a lot of things virtually, just like today. We're doing Zoom depositions, Zoom trials. Um, we're, we're able to do those things virtually, but there are some delays. So, um, you know, be patient and we're trying to work through those. I do think that the division is going to institute some of the things that we've done during COVID um, going forward as permanent changes um, because they have worked well. And I think it's, it's less um, time consuming for the people involved. So I think we'll see some of those things go on to the future. I think the current procedures with regard to people not being able to go into the division as much will continue until 2022. Um, and then we're expected to get some more, more guidance at that point. <clears throat> okay, I think that concludes our presentation. Terry, are there any other open questions that we've got before we let everybody go? I know we're right at one o'clock right now. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it, Laura. That was very nice of you to do. There, there was just one quick one about disfigurement. Um, how is disfigurement calculated in the settlement process? Disfigurement is typically used as basically meaning scarring. So if somebody happens to have a like a carpal, bilateral carpal tunnel claim, for example, where surgery is performed and it leaves a scar on the wrist, whether it be one wrist, both wrists, or let's say shoulder surgery to a visible area, it really accounts as visible, a visible area on the body 
and a judge is the one that makes that decision of how much disfigurement an employee may get. And typically speaking, the judge makes that allocation based upon their observation, I guess, in a in a video world or a virtual world, they may, I don't know, Laura, how they're doing it, but I would think they probably look at it from a virtual standpoint and they make the award. The maximum amount of disfigurement that a judge can award is 40 weeks. So you take 40 weeks times the comp rate. It could be a substantial amount of money, but typically speaking, it's, you know, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. It just depends on how big the scar is and how visible the scar is. But disfigurement is a part of the settlement based upon input from the judge. Well, and often our claim reps will ask for a picture. So if, if sometimes if, if you get a request for a picture, that's why they're asking for that picture is to look at disfigurement or the damages from the injury and accident. Other right. one then, I think that's all the, all the questions we have. Okay. Well, if we have no other questions, we really do appreciate everybody's time in setting in through this conference. And on behalf of Missouri Employers Mutual and Provisor, the premier, regional carrier in the Midwest handling the states of Kansas, Arkansas, Kentucky, Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska. We really thank you for your attendance and we look forward to seeing you and talking to you in a future webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.